Welcome everyone. During this lecture we're going to introduce the definition of angular momentum. We'll introduce the equations for the angular momentum of a rotating body as well as the angular momentum of an object traveling along a straight line. We'll introduce applications of angular momentum. We'll also introduce the conservation of angular momentum theorem and then we'll introduce an application of the conservation of angular momentum theorem. Let's begin by introducing the definition of angular momentum. Angular momentum is a measure of an object's relative influence during a collision which involves rotational motion. The symbol for angular momentum is L. An angular momentum is a vector quantity, and so we've introduced an arrow on top of this symbol. The units for angular momentum are kilogram meters squared per second. Let's now introduce the angular momentum for a rotating body as well as the angular momentum for an object traveling along a straight line. The angular momentum of a rotating body may be determined through the following equation. L equals I times omega. Let's interpret this. In order to determine the angular momentum of a rotating body, we need to know two things. I, of course, represents the object's moment of inertia, and omega represents the object's angular velocity. Of course, the moment of inertia of a point mass is just given by mr squared, and the moment of inertia of any other object may be determined through the table that's available within our textbook. Since angular momentum is a vector quantity, we need to also be aware of the sign in other words, if the object is rotating in a counterclockwise fashion, angular momentum is considered to be positive. On the other hand, if it's rotating in a clockwise fashion, angular momentum is considered to be negative. So we have to once again consider whether the angular momentum is positive or negative. Again, positive notes a counterclockwise rotation. Negative is selected when the object is rotating in a clockwise fashion. We will now introduce the equation for the angular momentum of an object that is traveling along a straight line.
In this case, the angular momentum is given by the following equation. m times v times d. Now the m refers to the object's mass, v refers to the object's velocity, d refers to something called the object's perpendicular moment arm, and we will need to discuss this uh, at length. So again, m refers to mass, v refers to velocity, and d refers to something called the perpendicular moment arm. This perpendicular moment arm can be determined through the following procedure. The first step is to extend the line of action of the object's velocity in both directions. The second step requires that we connect this line of action with the center of rotation using a perpendicular line. Once we carry out this procedure, the perpendicular moment arm which is called D equals the length of the line that was constructed in part two. We will now introduce two examples which apply these principles. In the first example, a 15 kilogram solid sphere with a radius of 1.2 meters rotates about an axis at a rate of 35 rpm. Determine its angular momentum with respect to the center of rotation C. In this case, the object is rotating. Let's take a look at the equation which describes the angular momentum of a rotating body. Here's the equation, and as you can see, it has two components. In order to calculate angular momentum, we need to determine the moment of inertia as well as the angular velocity of the object. And so L is given by I times omega. And the first thing we need to determine is the moment of inertia. Now, this is a solid sphere. 
In order to determine the moment of inertia of a solid sphere, we need to refer to our textbook, which contains a table for the moments of inertia of a variety of objects. From the table, the moment of inertia for a solid sphere is given by 2 fifths mr squared. In this case, the mass is given as 15 kilograms, and the radius equals 1.2 meters. If we process this using a calculator, the solution is 8.64. And of course, the units are kilogram meters squared per second. Next, we have to determine the sphere's angular velocity. Now, the angular velocity is given as 35 RPM. Of course, RPMs are unacceptable. They're not SI units. We have to convert the RPM to the proper units, which, of course, are radians per second. So we'll set up a conversion. We're looking for radians per second. We have 35 RPM, and we know that 1 RPM equals 0 0.1047 radians per second. The RPMs cancel, and the result is 3.665 radians per second. And so omega in its proper form equals 3.665 radians per second and now we can calculate the angular momentum again the angular momentum just equals I times omega the moment of inertia equals 8.64 the angular velocity equals 3.665 and if we multiply those two values, we obtain 31.67. And the units, once again, are kilogram meters squared per second. Now, this is just the magnitude of the angular momentum because the direction of rotation was not given in this problem, and so we'll assume that it is rotating in a counterclockwise fashion, which means we can leave this answer with a positive value. Let's keep in mind that this value, the 31.67, gives us an indication of how much influence this sphere would have if it was involved in a collision with another object. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, a 1.5 kilogram ball travels with a speed of 20 meters per second as shown below. Determine the magnitude and direction of its angular momentum with respect to the center of rotation, C. Let's first note that the center of rotation is indicated by this dot at the origin of a Cartesian coordinate system, so we'll label it as C. Let's also note that this object is traveling along a straight line path. And so let's look up the equation for the angular momentum of an object traveling along a straight line path. This is the equation that we introduced earlier. And as you can see, it has three components. We need to know the object's mass, its velocity, and something called the perpendicular moment arm. And so the equation is given by L equals mv times d. Let's note that the mass is known, so we could put a check mark over the mass. 
the velocity is also known, so we could check that. The only thing that we don't know is something called the perpendicular moment arm, and we laid out a procedure in order to determine the value for d. Let's take a look at that procedure. As you can see, in order to determine the value of d, step one requires that we extend the line of action for the object's velocity in both directions. This step is very straightforward. All we need to do is to trace out the ball's path in both directions. So we'll extend the line of action to the right and we'll also extend it to the left. And so the dotted line represents the extension of the ball's line of action. Step two requires that we connect the line of action that we just drew to the center of rotation with a perpendicular line. And so we need to connect the center of rotation to this line of action using a perpendicular line. I'm going to draw an arbitrary line, don't copy it yet, and I'd like for you to consider whether it meets the conditions of step two. So I'm going to connect this line of action to the center of rotation with this line right here. Does this line meet the conditions set forth in step number two? Well, the answer is no, because the requirement is that this line connects the center of rotation with the line of action in a perpendicular fashion, which means it needs to make a right angle, a 90 degree angle with respect to the line of action as you can see this is not a 90 degree angle and so this is not the representation of the perpendicular moment arm so let's erase it and I'd like for you to pause the video and see if you can determine the line which joins the center of rotation to the extension of the velocity in a perpendicular fashion The line that satisfies these conditions in step two looks like this. This red line, as you can see, connects the center of rotation to the line of action of the velocity in a perpendicular fashion because you can see that this is a 90 degree angle right here. The length of this line represents the magnitude of the perpendicular moment arm and as you can see the length of this line is three meters so this red line represents d in our equation that is the length of d and now we're ready to solve for the object's angular momentum and so the mass of the object equals 1.5 kilograms the velocity equals 20 meters per second and d has a value of 3 in this case. If we multiply these values together the result equals 90 and the units are kilogram meters squared per second. We now have to determine whether this value is positive or negative. We will now introduce the conservation of angular momentum theorem. The conservation of angular momentum theorem states that when two or more objects interact through a collision
which involves rotational motion the system's initial angular momentum will equal the system's final angular momentum provided that the net external torque is negligible. This theorem tells us that whenever there's a collision involving rotational motion, the system's initial angular momentum just before, during, and just after the collision will be constant. And it also specifies a condition that the net external torque acting on the system is negligible. In other words, if we have external forces that are producing torque, that torque has to be very close to zero it cannot affect the collision. We will now introduce the definition of a collision which is similar to the definition we presented earlier. A collision is defined as one of three events. A collision is considered to be a convergence of two masses, a divergence of two or more masses, or a redistribution of one or more masses. We have a very good understanding of the first two types of collisions. However, we need to discuss the third one, which is called a redistribution of one or more masses. What's meant by a redistribution of mass? Well, if you consider someone spinning pizza dough, the pizza dough starts out in the shape of a sphere, and as we toss it into the air and spin it, the pizza dough stretches out and takes on the shape of a disc. This process is considered to be a redistribution of mass. In other words, we're moving the mass around and reforming the shape. This process is actually considered to be a collision. As another example, let's consider a figure skater spinning in place with their arms extended. If they suddenly pull their arms inwards, that's considered a redistribution of mass and the act of pulling the arms inwards is considered to be a collision. 
we will now introduce the conservation of angular momentum theorem in equation form. The theorem states the following. The theorem states that if we add up the angular momentum for each component within the system initially, that result will equal the summation of the angular momentum for each component within the system finally. The expanded version of the theorem looks like this. And so if the system consists of three components, we will have three terms on the left and three terms on the right. If it consists of two components, of course, we will only have two components on the left and two components on the right. Let's also keep in mind that for a rotating object, the angular momentum is just given by I times omega. On the other hand, for an object moving in a straight line, The equation is given by M V D. Finally, let's keep in mind that the direction must be considered as well. In other words, counterclockwise is considered to be positive, and clockwise rotation is considered to be negative. We will now introduce an example that involves the application of the conservation of angular momentum theorem. In this example, a 75 kilogram soccer player stands next to a 3 kilogram soccer ball on the rim of a merry-go-round as shown below. The merry-go-round may be considered to be a uniform solid disc with a mass of 12 kilograms and a radius of 4.5 meters. The system is initially rotating at a rate of 2.5 radians per second in a counterclockwise direction when the soccer player kicks the ball with a velocity of 50 meters per second in a tangential direction. In part A, we need to determine the soccer player's initial moment of inertia. Let's begin by first noting that the system consists of three components. We have the disc, we have the soccer player, and we have the ball. And so we need to label each of these accordingly. We'll label the disc as M1. We'll label the soccer players M2. And the ball will be labeled as M3. According to the problem, the mass of the disc is 12 kilograms. The mass of the soccer player is 75 kilograms. And the mass of the ball is 3 kilograms. So again, this is the disc, this is the player, and this is the ball. Let's also note that the radius of the disc is 4.5 meters, and that it's initially rotating at 2.5 radians per second in a counterclockwise direction. And so we can write 
that the radius equals 4.5 meters and omega initial equals 2.5 radians per second. In part A, we would like to determine the soccer player's initial moment of inertia. Of course, moment of inertia is represented by the letter I, and we're referring to the soccer player as mass number 2, so we would like to find I2 initial. It's important to note that the soccer player can be considered as a point mass. Also, the soccer player standing on the rim of the disc, therefore the value for R just equals the radius of the disc. If the soccer player was located closer, we would have to adjust R accordingly. Again, R represents the distance between the center of rotation and the location of the point mass. Of course, the moment of inertia for a point mass is given by mR squared, and in this case it's m2 times r2 initial that has to be considered. The mass is 75. The player is located 4.5 meters away from the center. We will square that. And as a result, I2 initial equals 1,519. And the units for moment of inertia are kilogram times meters squared. In part B, we would like to determine the initial angular momentum of each of the system's components. Let's start with the angular momentum for the disk. L1 initial is given by I1 initial times omega initial. Notice that we're using the angular momentum for a rotating body because the disk is in fact a rotating body in this case. The moment of inertia for a rotating disk from our table is given by one half mr squared. So this becomes one half m1 r1 initial squared times omega initial. That results in one half the mass of the disk is 12, the radius is 4.5, and omega initial was given as 2.5 radians per second. As a result, L1 initial equals 303.8. And the units for angular momentum are kilogram meters squared per second. Now we need to consider the sign of the angular momentum. Since the disk is initially rotating in a counterclockwise fashion, the sign is going to be positive. So we'll introduce a positive in front. And note that this is because the disk is spinning in a counterclockwise direction. Let's now find the angular momentum of the soccer player. We'll refer to that as L2 initial. And since the soccer player is also rotating, the equation that we'll be applying is I2 initial omega initial. Let's also note that the soccer player is rotating at the same rate as the disc initially. We already calculated the moment of inertia of the soccer player. That value was given as 1519. We're going to multiply that by omega initial which is 2.5. 
and the result equals 3,797 kilogram meters squared per second. Since the soccer player is also rotating initially in a counterclockwise fashion, we're going to assign a positive value to this angular momentum. So there's the plus sign, and again, that comes from the fact that the soccer player is rotating in a counterclockwise sense. Finally, let's calculate the angular momentum for the soccer ball. We'll call that L3 initial. And once again, the soccer ball can be considered as a rotating object. Therefore, the angular momentum is given by I3 initial, omega initial. In this case, the soccer ball is a point mass, and so the moment of inertia is given by mR squared times omega initial. The mass of the soccer ball is 3 kilograms. The soccer ball is also located on the rim of the disc, so the radius is 4.5, and omega initially is 2.5. That results in an angular momentum of 151.9 kilogram meters squared per second. And of course, the soccer ball is rotating initially in a counterclockwise fashion. Therefore, we will include a positive sign in front of this angular momentum. In part C, we would like to determine the final angular momentum of each of the system's components. Let's start with the disk. L1 final will equal I1 final times omega final. Of course, I1 final is given by one half M1 R1 final squared times omega final. Now, let's notice that nothing has changed about the disk. It has the same mass, it has the same radius, so the final moment of inertia will equal the initial moment of inertia. Nothing will change. So this will result in one half. The disk has a mass of 12. The radius is 4.5. However, we do not know the value of omega final, and so we will just leave it as a variable. And as a result, L1 final will just equal 121.5 times omega final. We'll just have to leave it as an expression for now. Now let's also note that at the end of the problem the system will continue to rotate in a counterclockwise fashion therefore we will include a positive sign, a plus sign in front of L1F because the system is still rotating in a counterclockwise sense. Likewise, L2 final equals I2 final, omega final. Again, I2 final is the same as I2 initial. There's nothing changed about the soccer player. His mass is the same, his location is the same. Therefore, I2 final is the same as I2 initial, which we can note. And so we could save a little bit of time by incorporating that value. I2 initial was found earlier as 1519 times omega final. And so we can write L2 final equals 1519 times omega final. And since the soccer player is also rotating in a counterclockwise sense, 
we can include a plus sign in front of this expression. Let's now consider the soccer ball. Now, at the end of the problem, the soccer ball is not rotating. Let's take a look. At the end of the problem, the soccer ball is taking off in a straight line. Therefore, we can't use the angular momentum expression for a rotating body. We have to use the other expression, which represents an object moving along a straight line. The expression for the angular momentum of an object moving along a straight line is given by m v d. Now we do have the mass of the soccer ball. The velocity was also given. However, we need to determine the perpendicular moment arm. In order to determine the perpendicular moment arm, in connection with the soccer ball, let's consider an overhead view. Imagine if we have a camera overhead and we take an overhead shot of the disc and the ball being kicked. So here's an overhead shot and we will now apply the procedure that we described earlier in order to find D. In step one of the procedure we need to extend the line of action for the object's velocity in both directions. And in the second step, we need to connect the line of action to the center of rotation with a perpendicular line. Now, step one is very straightforward. We just need to extend the line of action for the velocity in both directions. So we'll extend it to the right, and we will extend it to the left as well. we now need to connect this line to the center of rotation using a perpendicular line. We can achieve this as follows. There's the line that connects the center of rotation to the extension of the velocity in a perpendicular fashion. You can see that this is a perpendicular connection between the two. And so this line represents the magnitude of D. And of course, the length of this line just equals the radius of our circle, which is 4.5 meters. And so with that, L3 final can be calculated through the mass of the ball, which is 3. The velocity was given as 50, and as we noted just now, the length of the perpendicular moment arm is the same as the radius of the circle, which equals 4.5 meters. We now need to consider whether to introduce a positive sign or a negative sign in front of this expression. As you recall, in order to make that determination, we need to consider what would happen if the ball collided with this rod. Remember, we're imagining that D is a rod that is hinged at the center and this rod is free to rotate about the center. You can also imagine it as the minute hand or the hour hand on a clock which is hinged at the center. And so if this ball was allowed to collide with this rod, the ball would collide toward the right and cause the rod to rotate in this direction. That direction is clockwise and therefore the angular momentum is considered to be negative. So we'll introduce a minus sign in front and note that we did so because of the clockwise nature of the rotation. Therefore L3 final equals negative 675 and the units are kilogram meters squared per second. Finally in part D we would like to determine the final angular velocity of the merry-go-round. In other words we're trying to determine 
What happens when the soccer player kicks the ball? Will the merry-go-round increase its speed, maintain its speed, or will it slow down? Let's find out. So we need to determine omega final. And of course, that would be the final angular velocity of the merry-go-round as well as the soccer player, because the soccer player is still located on the rim of the merry-go-round. Now, when the soccer player kicks the ball, that interaction is considered to be a collision because the objects are diverging, right? The soccer ball leaves the system. That's considered to be a divergent collision, and because of that, the system is qualified towards the application of the conservation of angular momentum theorem. So we're going to apply the conservation of angular momentum theorem. Now notice that we have three components within our system, and so we will use the version that contains three components. Here is the conservation of angular momentum theorem, and we will use, once again, the version that contains three components. And so L1 initial plus L2 initial plus L3 initial must equal L1 final plus L2 final plus L3 final. Now we've already done the calculations, so it's just a matter of incorporating our results. L1 initial was determined to equal 303.8. L2 initial was calculated as 3797. An L3 initial was calculated as 151.9. And all of them were positive. On the other side, L1 final was calculated as 121.5 times omega f L2 final was calculated as 1519 omega f and L3 final was calculated as negative 675. If we add all of the terms on the left, we get a result of 4253. If we add the like terms on the right, we end up with 1641 omega final minus the 675. Let's transfer the 675 to the other side now. And we end up with 4253 plus the 675 equals 1641 times omega final. The left hand side becomes 4928, the right hand side is 1641 omega final, and if we solve for omega final, we end up with 3.003, .003. and of course the units are radians per second. And so we can observe that the angular velocity of the system actually increased as a result of the soccer player kicking the ball from the rim. And that concludes this lecture.